Okay, so I've kept this picture up here on the board. The scenario that we have is that we want to do this double integral over some region R. And for some reason, and it could be because we don't like the integrand or it could be because we don't like the region R, we decide that we want to change to doing a different integral with different variables. I've illustrated it as we don't like the region R. So we're hoping that there's some nice region that we're calling S over here in the UV plane that we can map to R via some transformation T. That's going to be a function whose input is U and V and whose output is X and Y. So a two-dimensional input, two-dimensional output. Okay, we put some restrictions on T. We said it's going to have to be one-to-one. -one. In particular, that's going to ensure that there's an inverse because we're really trying to work backwards here. Okay, And it's going to have to have continuous first partials. And if we can find such a transformation in a region, we're hoping that we can then do a double integral over S. F of T of UV is going to give me the same Z values as F of XY, but I would expect there to be some scaling factor when I switch from integrating with respect to area in the XY plane to integrating with respect to area in the UV plane. I should probably have these axes labeled. Okay, so as we try to figure out how this works, we're going to go through our usual four-step process. So I'm going to chop things into little pieces. And the question is, where do I start? Do I start with this region or do I start with this region? And the answer is we start here. So I'm going to chop my what I'm thinking of as my nice region into nice little pieces. I'm going to chop this up into beautiful rectangles. And it's not essential that the rectangles have this, all have the same base and all have the same height, but that's going to simplify things. So I'm going to use some regular partitions to chop the interval along the, sorry, the u-axis into equal pieces and the interval along the v-axis into equal pieces. So I'm going to have a bunch of rectangles that looks something like this, whose dimensions are delta u and delta v. Okay. And I'm using different colored lines for the horizontal and vertical lines because I'm going to keep track of that. Chopping up s is going to induce a chopping of r. Essentially, each of these horizontal lines, t is going to send that to some curve that's going to chop R into little strips. And each of the vertical lines, T is going to send that to some curve that's going to chop R into strips. Now, I've sort of made it so that we preserve the semi-horizontal and semi-vertical. It's not always going to be that simple and that nice, but that's what we're doing. So chopping S into rectangles induces a chopping of R into little pieces. <laughs> and I know what I want to do then is I want to approximate. Now what I want to do is I want to approximate the signed volume that lies above each one of these little pieces. <laughs> but each one of these little pieces I can now associate with one of these little pieces. <laughs> so I've got one of these guys. that's get being associated now with one of these guys. <laughs> and my function f is attaching a z value or a height to every point on here. I'm trying to approximate the signed volume that lies above this, and I'm going to do that by basically approximating both the height and the area of the base. We're used to just having to approximate the height. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick a representative point right here. So I'm just going to call that u star v star. Now I'd be doing that for each one of these rectangles. So if I were doing it for the ij rectangle, I'd have subscripts of i and j. 
I'm just going to do it here for a generic rectangle, and then we'd have to add up all of those. Okay. All right. Now, that's going to correspond to some point here, which I'm going to just call x star, y star. But that is t of u star, v star. Okay. So this corner point here gets sent to this corner point here. Again, with the transformation, it's not necessarily going to be the case that I can clearly see what a corner point is. Because my transformation might take something that meets at a right angle and map it to something that meets at a straight angle, so I lose that corner point. Here, I've made it so that we can sort of see where it came from. It's not always going to be so visually clear. Okay. So, if I want to approximate the signed volume, that lies above this piece, I'm going to say that's going to be approximately the height times the area of the base. Now, approximating the height we're used to doing. The height is changing. That's inconvenient. We go into denial. We pretend it doesn't change. So, I'm just going to approximate the height as being my function evaluated at t of u star v star. So evaluated at this particular point right here. I'm going to treat it as if the height is constant over that interval. Okay. Most of the work that I need to do here is going to be in approximating the area of the base. So that's what I need to fill in here, see if I can figure out what that's going to look like. Okay. Well. What I'm going to do for this particular area, let's see if I can get another color marker. Okay. I'm going to try to approximate the area of this potentially blobular region with the area of a parallelogram. This is just a curve in the xy plane. If I could calculate the tangent line to that curve, and scale it so that it's close to the length of that curve, that would approximate this curve right here. And if I could do the same thing here, if I could approximate the tangent line of this curve and scale it so that its length approximates the length of that curve, then I could create this lovely parallelogram here and I could say the area of this parallelogram is approximately the length of this blobular region that I have right here. So the question then is, how do I figure out what those vectors are? Okay. Well, I can do that because you'll notice this curve right here was the image of this curve right here. Now, these blue lines were, were basically horizontal lines because v was constant. Here we held v constant and we allowed u to change. So this blue curve that I have right here, I can call that a constant v curve. And similarly, the green curves here came from the green lines here, which is where I was holding u constant and letting v vary. So I can call those green curves constant u curves. Now, if I apply my transformation t to one of these blue lines, it's going to map it to one of these blue curves. But I'm now making it a function of one variable because I'm holding v constant, which means that the vector that's tangent to it is just going to be the partial derivative of t with respect to, for the blue lines, with respect to u because that's the variable here. So I'm thinking that this vector right here 
is going to be some multiple of the partial of t with respect to u evaluated at u star v star, evaluated at this point, which maps to this point, which is where I'm calculating the tangent vector. That vector is going to point in the right direction that's tangent to this constant v curve. Okay. Now, points in the right direction, that doesn't mean it's necessarily the same length. Okay. Because if I think about it, this is giving me the rate of change of t with respect to u at this particular point. That's telling me how much t is going to change if u changes by one unit. But I'm not allowing u to change by one unit. I'm allowing u to change by this amount, which we said was delta u. So I'm going to scale this by delta u. That vector is going to approximate this curve. <laughs> Similar argument over here, this green curve we said was a constant u curve. That's what I get when I apply t to one of these green lines where u is constant and v is changing. So if v is what's changing, then the vector that's tangent to the curve is going to be the partial of t with respect to v, again, at this point. Okay. In order to make the length about right, I want to say, but wait a minute, I'm not necessarily letting v change by one unit, I'm letting it change by delta v units, so let's scale that derivative vector by delta v. That's going to give me these vectors that approximate these two sides. Okay, this is a long process. I'm going to stop the video here, draw a slightly cleaner picture, and come back and we'll keep going with this.